basically a new narcotic or psychotropic drug that in its pure form of preparation that is not yet controlled by United Nations drug conventions, but that may pose a public health threat comparable to those substances that are already listed. Basically something new that hasn't been scheduled, that hasn't been focused on by either law enforcement or public health organizations. And um, just since to, to kind of put these things in context, Literally the weekend before I planned on coming out here, a uh, music festival in Florida in the United States had a bad batch of one of these novel psychoactive substances that are as yet undetermined of an identity that resulted in the death of, death of two and the hospitalization of 57. That is a substance that we still have no idea what it is and it was flagged as some type of molly or amphetamine type stimulant. This is the this is the standard, ladies and gentlemen. People don't know what the stuff is, but the news is going to flag it as something such as MDMA or a psychedelic because they don't know, and until they don't know, whatever kind of previous and pre-existing bias that exists about drugs is going to be slapped onto it. And to give you a sense of the scope of the problem, this is from the EMCDDA uh, last year. That's the number of novel substances that have been picked up by the organization just in Europe alone. And I do want to emphasize that the bottom half, that's 60 new substances, the red and green bars, that's entirely taken up by those amphetamine type stimulants that have potentially psychedelic effects or synthetic cannabis like K2 and spice, those fake pots that have been showing up all over. And these substances are not just different brands. These are unique chemicals that are being synthesized and sold in gray markets all over the world. Uh, this is a you know, chemical structure comparison between some of the more classic substances like THC and amphetamine and the other drugs that are now showing up such as UR144 and MDPV like you saw earlier. This is a some data from the uh, National Health Services report from Scotland, basically talking about drugs and drug effects every year. And um, I don't really know how to make this any more stark. I am not familiar with etizolam, which is designer benzodiazepines. I am not familiar with ethylphenidate, which is a chemical uh, iteration on Ritalin. But these are substances that did not exist on the radar of medical practitioners in 2012 and are now killing more people than all, all classic psychedelics and MDMA combined. Uh, this is a study from uh, a music festival out in the United States, basically um, an organization stood outside of the booth and told people, hey listen, We'll give you 20 bucks if you tell us what you took, what you're planning on taking, and uh, you know um, if you give us a blood or urine sample so we can confirm. And a lot of people had a very specific understanding of what they were taking. They you know, largely believed they were taking marijuana, alcohol, cocaine, and MDMA. But out of the 104 participants, even though 30% had said they were taking MDMA, Many, many individuals who had said they were taking it also tested positive for a bath salt called alpha PVP. Additionally, they were also testing positive for methylone, ethylone, or butylone, which are three amphetamine type stimulants that are considered novel psychedelics, uh, novel psychoactive substances. And this means that straight up, Many, many individuals that are consuming these drugs are not consuming them on purpose. They are cons they're purchasing something underground from either a dealer or a friend, and they are literally getting something completely different. You know, this is a very, very different situation than when you would purchase LSD and you would get a piece of paper. You know, there's a very big difference between getting simply nothing and getting a totally different substance that approximates the effects you were looking for. This is some research that's actually still in press by um, Dr. Joseph Palomar at NYU. And uh, I would like to kind of emphasize the findings, so I'm just going to read the table results. Um, racial minorities 
were more likely to report no lifetime bath salt use, but have a positive hair sample for bath salts. And additionally, those who reported no use of bath salts, but tested positive for an NPS, were more likely to report having earned less than a bachelor's degree. This starts to paint a very, very disturbing picture of the idea that the individuals that are not getting the psychedelic that they want are generally lower income, maybe less educated, maybe a minority individual. And that is a trend that is deeply concerning for me. The idea that your class, your race, your ethnicity, or your education would in fact determine whether you are able to have the psychedelic experience of your choosing. Um, I think that is something that is only now developing as a problem and we need to start taking it seriously because it affects not only our you know, the perception of psychedelics, but the actual experience that people en masse are having. This is a study from 2013 um, in published in drug testing and analysis that showed just, you know, look for the data for yourself. I know that some of us may be familiar with 2CI and 2CE, but I do not recommend consuming 25I PMA, PP, uh, PMMA or, you know, 4FMA unless you have very, very specific understandings of what these drugs are. And these are total notifications by member states to the um, monitoring organization so that these are the number of times these drugs managed to hit an ER that were totally novel and the systems didn't know how to handle them. And um, when I do mean there are a lot of drugs, I mean there are a lot of new drugs. Um, I'm not familiar with most of these. Uh, I don't think anyone in this building is actually familiar with most of these, you know, and, and that is hugely worrying because if all of a sudden you have a forensic psychologist, I had an NYPD forensic examiner call me and ask me about one of these sedatives. I have no idea. I mean, these drugs didn't exist two to three years ago, and now they're starting to show up in autopsy reports. My biggest concern is that one of these is going to be deeply problematic. Speaking about those synthetic cannabinoids, just in the United States, the stars mean that they're Schedule One, and the other drugs are not. When you buy K2 or Spice, they don't tell you what the active ingredient is. They don't tell you which one of these chemicals you're actually getting. So one brand may be 100% legal for human, you know, for having not been scheduled yet, and the other one could be a class one felony. So just because of how crazy this is, I wanted to take Professor David Nutt's words directly. You know, one of the dangers of this approach is that it has been taken if we ban every new drug without a balanced view, then people will keep making more new drugs to replace them, and eventually they will make something that's extremely toxic, which, when the kids take it, they will die. That, I don't want to be a fear monger, I don't want to try and be aggressive about this, but I think that the amount of new substances that have hit the market in the last five years that mimic classic psychedelics or have similar symptoms is tremendously problematic. And w w even though we may not interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis, some people are. So some of the more problematic ones that we have evidence for, firstly, 25I. I don't know if anyone in the room is aware of this substance, but um, it's something that can be used safely. There are definitely people that I know that have preferences for it under certain environments, under certain conditions. But it also has been associated with 17 deaths in the United States in the last six years. We have had individuals be medically transported from festivals because they've had seizures at half an hour after dosing. You know, one of the biggest problems with it is that it's active at a microgram level, just like LSD. But because of the fact that most people are usually only getting it from either street dealers or festival dealers, they're not getting exact dosages. You know, the biggest problem with that is that LSD is a relatively harmless substance. You may not have a, the best day if you take five tabs accidentally, but you'll be fine. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll wake up the next day. 
This is not the case with NBOM. There are reports of seizures happening, it's cardiovascular events, agitation and aggressive behavior, and renal failure. You know, this is, this is being scheduled. It's Schedule 1 in the United States. It's going to be scheduled in Canada as well. And um, it's definitely not something I'd like to be caught with in the European Union. Um, one substance that got very, very big and then was quashed, thankfully, is a uh, second-generation bath salt, commonly known as alpha PVP. The street names for it include flaca and gravel, just in case you wanted to get a sense of how awesome this substance is. This is, I think, a pretty stark illustration of the problem, where this is just the number of crime lab reports submitted bet between MDMA and synthetic cathinones. This basically means that around 2011, MDMA purity essentially evaporated in the United States, and synthetic cathinones rushed in to fill the void. Um, basically, in 16 months, you had 63 deaths in one city, in one state alone. That's not including all 50 states, because those numbers are still kind of hard to generate. But when you're getting 20 ER visits a day from a substance that didn't exist five years beforehand, there's kind of a huge pressure on law enforcement, public health, and governmental authorities to do something. One of the biggest steps forward they were able to make was they were able to push and pressure China to stop manufacturing the substance. So with that combined with an extensive law enforcement effort across the United States, cases of alpha PVP intoxication dropped to almost nothing, which in my opinion is a very, very good thing. It shows that targeted interventions for a lot of these substances can actually work. However, that also means we have to see them and we have to do something about it. You know, just to give you a scope of the problem, again, that's the number of different brands that were found in just Gainesville, Florida, of synthetic cannabinoids and synthetic cathinones. And the list of side effects that go from anywhere from self-mutilation, tachycardia, transcend transient ischemic attacks, nausea, and serotonin syndrome. These are drugs that have risk profiles and side effects that classical hallucinogens and psychedelics have never had. And because of that fact, I think they're deeply problematic for the continued push to mainstream and normalize actually non-harmful psychedelics. You know, just to give you a little bit more information about synthetic cannabinoids, they're actually, the, the proper term is synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists because they're not actually cannabinoids. They're chemicals that were used to explore the cannabinoid receptor system. And there are three classes of them, but at the same time, they are all full agonists of CB1 and CB2, even though THC and CBD aren't. You know, these aren't drugs that were created to get high from. These were drugs to, created to explore the animal model of the cannabinoid receptor system. You know, the, the biggest problem is they have no quality assurance or quality control policies when these are being created. So not only do you have cross-contamination between brands of these synthetic cannabinoids, you have what are known as hot spots. Hot spots are basically what happens when someone's making drugs in their basement where you take a pile of plant matter and you spray the, the synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonist on it, but the, the coverage is uneven. So that means you have differential quality and purity within the same bag of drug, which is insane if you think about it for, any, you know, for more than five seconds. But there's nothing to be done about this because they exist in this gray market universe where if you stay one step ahead of a regulator, you can buy this stuff at a gas station. You know, there's this, uh, there's this writer that I know, he, he has this uh, blog called The Dose Makes the Poison where he talks about different substances and their problematic, you know, f their, their problematic issues from a toxicology perspective. And I think he said it the best. You know, the vast majority of people using these substances and products are consuming substances of unknown identity with unknown pharmacological and toxicological profiles and unknown combinations, unknown dosages. This is 
probably the craziest thing that I've ever heard. Like the fact that it's not just a hallucinated fantasy, but the reality of thousands, if not tens of thousands of drug users all across the world is deeply kind of troubling to me. Um, I'm going to talk very quickly about two substances that have been showing up in other drugs such as fentanyl. Um, basically, U not, U18 is a novel opioid, or is considered a novel opioid, that has started showing up in benzodiazepines and designer benzodiazepine mixtures. And it's an opioid that has no activity at any of the opioid receptors, even though it's seen as approximately 10,000 times as powerful as heroin. We have no evidence of opioid receptor activity, but it's being considered an opioid. This is madness. You know, the, 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 I, the narrative is completely different than what's actually going on in the science. You know, and in the United States and Canada, we have additional problems when it comes to high potency, high strength opioids infecting non opioid medications. Where you have, because I can tell you right now, I can't tell the difference between those two benzodiazepines. One of them's actually made of an opioid that could probably kill you. The other one's Xanax. I mean, Xanax is not a great drug, but at the same time, it's certainly not lethal. Um, you know, that's the problem, because once you combine something, a painkiller like fentanyl, and an op a novel sedative, such as one of these, you know, that giant stack that I showed you earlier, you end up with people in a very, very dangerous place. So now I want to talk about kind of why it's different this time around. You know, this is how we report those issues. You know, we don't really say what the drug is. We just slap the term rave onto the party and molly onto the drug. And we say this person was hospitalized because they overdosed on molly. Um, just as a show of hands, or, you know, call out. Um, what color is molly? Okay, does the fact that I heard five different answers bother anyone else? <laughs> Like, if, 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 your, if your daily painkiller was three different colors, would you take it? You know, it, and it, obviously, that, that's kind of, a, you know, a push out. <clears throat> but at the same time, ecstasy and molly are a very, very loaded term. LSD means LSD. Psilocybin means psilocybin. But now we have these catch-all phrases that include almost anything. If I take molly that has MDA in it, it's going to be a little bit more psychedelic. If I take molly that has MDMA and a stimulant in it, I'm going to be running around for three hours. But at the end of the night, I'm still going to have the term molly associated with an array of behavioral symptoms in my head. So when we talk about it, we're going to have two completely different, different definitions, but we're not going to confirm that. I'm not going to go, hey, was your Molly speedy? Like, I'm just going to think that it is because that's what my experience was. You know, and more importantly, <coughs> NPSs, most of them, can't be detected by drug tests yet. I mean, this is one of the reasons why people do them. You know, you work in security, you have, work in par you have a you know, parole officer, you have all of these kind of concerns, and you can't be caught with a drug test. You can't be testing positive for cannabis or cocaine or, you know, a, anything. So you have one of these other options, which, you know, you maybe won't get arrested, but you might die. Um, <laughs> and also, like specific details, and this is where I think it affects the psychedelic research renaissance, can slip through the cracks. You know, there was this very famous story a couple of years back of this bath salts causing this person to like eat this other person's face, and it was terrifying. Except there were no bath salts in his system. It, there, were no, there wasn't even any cannabis in his system. He was just mentally ill. But the story was run and pushed past and got super famous in the same way that every time there's a molly overdose, what the drug actually is, is kind of completely ancillary to the ch story chasing. You know, there was, there was a, a case in a university in the northeast of the United States where somebody had taken a bunch of what seemed to be MDMA, but it was actually a synthetic cannabinoid. And that's a psychedelic, but at the same time, the story had already kind of come and gone, and a certain drug had been demonized. 
And that's where we are now. You know, the Psychoactive Substances Act in the UK passed recently, and now we have this forensic strategy where we're going to be illegalizing drugs based on the receptor that it acts on, which, one, it only acts, the, the, the law only stated that receptor activity at CB1, GABA, 5-HT2A, NMDA, mu opioid, or a monamine transporter would be affected. So if you can create a drug that gets you messed up on, a, that uses a different receptor, you're good. <laughs> Which I think that's the problem. We're just gonna keep pushing innovation that pivots around these laws because we're using a very, very poor fat, you know, measure of psychoactivity. And this leads to, unfortunately, my nightmare. You know, what happens when an exceptionally damaging synthetic cathinone or novel psychedelic is created and then pushed into a recreational drug supply and then consumed by someone important, i.e. Donald Trump's daughter? You know, what happens when, say, for example, at Fashion Week or, you know, a, a very important party in Washington, D.C. or something like that in Europe, where something goes horribly wrong because a drug that is novel is introduced as a replacement or a cut into a, a classical chemical. If that happens, we're gonna see a lot of this environmental like friendliness get very, very cold very quickly. A lot of the research and a lot of the funding that a people in this room and this building are relying on is gonna dry up because I guarantee you they won't know the difference. You know, we barely know the difference between a lot of the more novel and nuanced substances. I can tell you that Donald Trump will simply not care. You know, so kind of bringing it back to us, you know, what can we do? I think we need to check our drugs. Like, people need to test their substances. If you're going to go out, you need to stay hydrated. You need to understand that if you're taking a novel substance that you shouldn't be redosing, that you shouldn't take one and then take a two more an hour later. You know, there are great harm reduction services such as Zendo and the harm reduction services at the Boom Festival in Portugal. These are all organizational structures that need to be supported because really they're the only ones that are preventing this from happening. And more specifically, especially for my advanced psychonauts out there, we need to accept that trip reports on Arrowwood and Blue Light are not research. This is one person's story in one environment about the psychedelic that maybe has no bearing on whether it's going to be safe for you to consume. So please, please, be cautious. You know, what, one of the other things that I would love to see, this came out of Switzerland, where they were documenting all of the psychoactive substance environmental cases that they had seen. There was no bias. They said, here's all the stuff that we saw. We tested everything. And here were the new novel substances that we are not really familiar with. That, that kind of conversation engenders safety. And also, one last thing is, we need to stop treating psychedelics users like children. You know, messages that recognize drug user subjects as evincing competence, responsibility, and a desire to reduce harm while simultaneously pursuing pleasure may be experienced as empowering by young users. You know, don't tell them that it's going to kill them because they kind of have already done the research. A lot of stuff isn't going to kill you. But if you tell everyone that, pot's going to kill you, acid's going to kill you, ecstasy's going to kill you, they're not going to listen to you when they get to n bomb. They're not going to listen to you when they get to bath salts. So in closing, you know, like where do we actually go as a, you know, collective from here? You know, very specifically realizing that we cannot schedule our way to safety. We just can't. There's too many drugs and the iteration cycle of drug development is getting faster faster and faster. You know, we're seeing third and fourth generation bath salts. We're seeing substances that have already overtaken 25i and a number of others. And that's just going to keep happening as these companies pivot around scheduling systems. I think we need to, dis we need to start exploring the facets of the psychedelic drug experience as an array of symptoms, not as a preference for a certain substance. Because we're now in a place where 
it's not just about I prefer LSD to psilocybin. It's I prefer this kind of visual space, this kind of mental space, this kind of activity level, because we have choice. And we have choice now like we've never had before. But that also means there are probably ones that are safer. There are probably ones that are better for certain types of activities. There are probably ones that no one should, there should be doing. You know, more specifically, we need to actually understand how certain substances are affected by dose, setting, and privilege. But of course, the easiest way to actually make this better would be to just end the war on psychedelics so people could get the drugs that they wanted. Thank you very much. Fantastic talk, thank you. So, since most people don't have access to a mass spectrometer, my more sophisticated festival goers are using test kits. Yes. And um, so the, the, the issue with these is that they're color change. Mm -hmm. And so if you get an admixture, which most of these things are, yep. and say something is 60% MDMA and 40% M PMA, how is that gonna, how does that test out in the color changes and how, how likely is one to get a false uh, a false positive. So one of the one of the, the best case practices when it comes to those uh, color change tests is you say for example if you have something that tests positive for MDMA there's a secondary test that can test for um, you know a bath salt a PMA something like that. So there's generally you can run up to four tests on a certain substance to give you four yes or no questions because you know we have to treat drugs like we're as asking a genie things. Um, I think the biggest thing is to also understand that a lot of people are also probably not going to take those steps because you have to use a piece of the drug. You know, I, I, I spent all my money on the MDMA. I'm not going to then take the MDMA and waste it. Um, I think what you're getting at is exactly the clinical limitations of harm reduction in this environment. You know, absolutely. Test it, test it at home, test it not under low light or black light or, you know, something like that. But also, you know, this is the difference between the privilege of an individual who has a regular dealer and someone who's buying something at, you know, uh, Glasgow or Ibiza or something like that. And, you know, we, 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 I want to tell you, you know, don't buy drugs from strangers. But at the same time, it's, that's something that people simply won't do. You know, they're, they're going to, and they're going to be in that environment. So we can only say, listen, test it. If it looks wacky, don't do it. You know, one, I, I do harm reduction drug checking for events in New York City and some other places. And thankfully, when we have tested and someone's stuff had come back as completely ridiculous, I've, I've never seen them take it. I've never seen them go, okay, this is not what I thought it was. I'm still going to put it in, you know. I, I've found that most people, once they realize that they've gotten something that they aren't prepared for, are generally willing to back away, which is hopeful, hope-inducing for me. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Ecstasy data, pill reports, blue light, you know, they, the biggest issue, the biggest limitation with those is that batch to batch, uh, batch to batch differentials, you know, and also copycats, where just because one's pill has, a, a, you know, large purity, et cetera, you develop a lot of copycat presses that people want to cash in on, you know. And the thing is, Europe is actually kind of having an opposite problem because after a specific drop in purity, which gave rise to bath salts in 2011, 2012, we're now seeing this giant spike in purity where we're having, where there are pills that are showing up in certain countries that are potent enough to be two or three doses. And, and I, I think if you look at the data there, you're going to find that bath salts kind of don't stack up. People aren't doing them anymore because I think there's a very clear preference for classical psychedelics that you only get into this other stuff when you can't get what you want. Um, kind of tailing on that, what are your thoughts on any possibility of centralized distribution in the near future? Or at least it, possibly of gray markets, possibly like decriminalization? Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's definitely a much more policy discussion that you may want to talk to Rick Doblin and the, you know, the individuals that spoke pretty you know, long about. I think it strengthens the case 
and you see a lot of policy, public policymakers stating that they hope that this helps push the conversation along because the only way to really fix this stuff is to get that uh, decriminalization or centralized distribution created. I was mostly curious that you were saying that it seems to you that traditional empathogens, traditional psychedelics are taking the blame in the press most often for mm -hmm. um, new use of psychoactive substances. In the UK, we've seen the complete opposite. So when methadrone was still legal, almost every death that occurred due to any drug was blamed on methadrone. And in actual fact, David Nutt has pointed out quite um, almost ironically, I'd say, that when methadrone was legal, we saw a drastic decrease in drug-related deaths from cocaine and amphetamine because, in actual fact, it's much less toxic. And once methadrone was made um, illegal, then those deaths spiked back up again. So mm -hmm. I would ask you, like, do you not think that the issue is not necessarily to do with these being novel substances, but more to do with prohibition in general? I mean, you've advocated intervention against them, but I feel that all of so the I think problems you've mentioned have been due to prohibition. What needs to happen is we need to have a serious discussion about what these da the damage that these drugs do and when they're useful. There are definitely people that I know in New York, Miami, LA that prefer methadrone to cocaine or MDMA, depending on the situation. But right now, the biggest issue when, say, in the United States is that I can't trust methadrone's purity. You may be able to in the UK, and that speaks to exactly the point. Exactly, and, and that, that is exactly until, because of the fact that prohibition is a binary issue that has a significant amount of resistance that is going to be a very, very long uphill battle, I think in the interim, we kind of, not only do we obviously need more research in what these drugs do, but we also need more funding such that the research when it comes to human trials, actual, like, you know, basic understanding of what happens with these things, independent of just blue light trip reports, et cetera, such that we can actually turn these into legal above ground medicines and you know, consume around that stuff. You know, one of the biggest things that I've seen is that independent of all of the stimulants that were made illegal in the United States in the 90s, a lot of methamphetamine had come in to replace that. And if they could get something like methadrone, ephedrine, something like that, they would be able to satisfy a need without necessarily going for a drug that's tremendously harmful. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, you need two minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm.